Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carolyn Keough, and, and I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs at the Olana Partnership. I'm so excited for you all to be here for this afternoon webinar. The Olana Partnership is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to inspire the public by preserving and interpreting Frederick Church's Olana, a New York State historic site and a National Historic Landmark within the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area. I'm so excited for this afternoon's webinar, Frederick Church as Design Visionary. We're very excited for this lively conversation, which is one of our series of virtual programs offered to provide important contemporary context for Frederick Church's artistic legacy, the history of his creation, Olana. A special thanks to our members who helped to make webinars like this possible. Please join us for our next webinar, Resurrected Landscapes, Frederick Church and the Public Park Movement with Rebecca Bedell on April 24th. This webinar is offered in anticipation of Afterglow, Frederick Church and the Landscape of Memory, an exhibition that opens May 16th. And it is also offered in celebration of New York State Park Centennial Year. You can learn more about this program and others that are coming up at olana.org slash programs. We hope that you can join us. Before we get started, a few notes on Zoom. As an attendee, your sound and video will remain off throughout this webinar. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions of our speakers. You are welcome to ask questions throughout the webinar, but we won't answer them until the final portion of the program. We'll be reserving about 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the very end of the conversation. You can move our speakers' images during the talk if the images are covering the PowerPoint by clicking the black bars above their pictures and dragging them. And if you're having any issues with your Zoom today, please contact us directly at education at olana.org. And my colleague and I will also be available for troubleshooting in the chat. So please join me in welcoming Sean Sawyer, the Olana Partnerships President, who will introduce this afternoon's wonderful speakers. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, uh, welcome, everyone. I'm so thrilled to uh, be able to introduce this afternoon's speakers, uh, panelists, uh, and also uh, that we are uh, really doing a first here today, I think, which is to really uh, have the opportunity um, to examine uh, interior design at Alana and really look through that lens uh, at church's accomplishments uh, and vision for the site. Um, and so it's uh, we're, we're very pleased to be able to uh, do this. Um, we have an extraordinary um, uh, group here uh, this afternoon, uh, and uh, I will give just very brief introductions and then turn the proceedings over. Um, Sheila Bridges, uh, who is uh, a, a creative visionary whose works have been showcased in museums uh, around the world, uh, including the Metropolitan, the Brooklyn Museum, the Cooper Hewitt, uh, those who are those sites that are very close to us. Uh, and uh, she um, has topped many of the uh, a national best designer list. Uh, and she is also a trustee of the Alana Partnership, which we are extremely proud of. And uh, on on um, April 30th this year at the Rainbow Room, we'll receive the Frederick Church Award. So uh, we'd love to have you join us for that and celebrate all that uh, Sheila has accomplished. Uh, we also are very pleased to have Young Ha, a Detroit native who founded uh, her firm uh, in 2007. Um, and she is also uh, a regular on uh, AD 100 list, El Decor A list, and, uh, and many other um, best um, top interior design lists. And then uh, our moderator today is Mitch Owens, uh, the American editor of the World of Interiors and a contributing editor of Architectural Digest, uh, author of, of numerous books uh, on design subjects. And um, we are very pleased uh, to have all of you here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Sheila and Young, one of the things I wanted to um, delve into is, is as, as Sean pointed out, uh, we're going to be discussing the um, interior design and decoration of, of Olana. And I, I know that for, for, for many people, um, Olana is an architectural experience first, and only after you spend a lot of time at the house um, on the tours, um, studying the rooms, does it become um, incredibly obvious that uh, a, a decorative aspect of uh, Olana is it, at least half, if not more, of the enjoyment. And I wanted to know from both of your perspectives, 
what was Olana like to you the first time you saw it? Um, Sheila, you want to go first or shall I? Uh, go ahead. You've got the floor. Go ahead. So um, at the first time I went to Olana, I was um, uh, there on a field trip and um, I was quite confused about what was happening. Um, I, it was just such a mix. I wasn't really sure what I was looking at. Um, and, you know, Sheila, um, as a board member, encouraged me to visit again. Um, I recently moved to the Hudson Valley um, and uh, we went on this lovely jaunt together. Um, and I believe it was Sheila's birthday, in fact. So we had special access to various rooms. And I was just blown away by how relevant um, the work is today. Olana today is such an inspiration for us as interior designers. It's so unique, it's so mm -hmm. brave. Um, it was clearly uh, created by someone who, you know, didn't care about what everyone else thought. He was really um, following his own vision. And Sheila? Yeah. Um, so honestly, I don't, I don't remember because it was probably around 25 years ago, the first time that I visited Sa Alana. Same for me. Yeah. So uh, it had been a long time, but I've of course been in the house uh, many times since then. Each time uh, I am in the house, I see something new or or focus on something different that I that I just sort of hadn't experienced previously. There is always uh, there's somebody's phone, but um, there's there's always something new to discover. Uh, I think that's why uh, we are always, you know, certainly encouraging people to come and do do a house tour um, because I'm, you know, I, as a designer, I'm always looking for inspiration and, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of it here uh, in the house. I know that's what I find fascinating about Olana is it is uh, on, on the one hand, you know, many of us just visit a historic site once and don't return very often. But o Olana just unfolds and unfolds and unfolds with repeated visits. Um, it's a it's it's a uh, a really a, an extraordinary um, amalgamation of of decoration and architecture and special effects and paint finishes and arrangements. I'm 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 always fascinated by this the 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 court hall, this sort of the spiritual center of the house that we're looking at now with the great stair that um, leads you up to the upper floors. And here in this sort of nook uh, within a much larger space that we'll see in just a moment, uh, is, is this a, sort of a glossary of, of, of what interested Frederick Church and his wife, Isabel, um, their love of the Near East, um, a reflection of that 18 months abroad uh, where a great period of time was, was spent in Beirut and Damascus, uh, looking at houses, looking at buildings, looking at um, details and, and bringing this back to the Hudson Valley. Um, I, I know that um, it, it's it's just a, a really an extraordinary focus at this moment when you turn and look at that. It tells you a lot about what they were thinking about the house. Yeah, I think um, this, uh, especially this area under the stairs, um, I think it's it's such an interesting mix of things. You can tell, um, you know, he's displaying um, his interests, um, items from his travels, uh, you know, um, the Buddha. I don't know how um, often it was that people would display sort of um, Eastern religious uh, works. Um, uh, you probably saw a lot more Madonnas showcased in special places than the Buddha. Um, and uh, I just think it's just 
wonderful and beautiful and, um, uh, you know, it's someone who really loves his, um, his collection. Are the collections, yeah. are what's important, Sheila, or is it that just the way all of these various textures and materials and shapes are brought together? I think it's probably more about the way that they're brought together. Uh, you know, to me, this this speaks to somebody who is passionate about uh, about collecting. Um, you know, uh, as Young pointed out, there's a sort of a Buddha under the staircase. Um, that is, I think, a neoclassical sculpture. Sculpture, which is was done by by someone locally from Albany. Oh yes, Erastus Dow. Yeah, and then and then there's looks like taxidermy of a peacock, uh, some furniture, uh, you know, items and decorative items, um, you know, sort of all of that. But then the backdrop, when you think about, you know, how elaborate uh, this staircase is. And also, you know, we're first sort of introduced to to the stenciling and his love of stenciling and uh, pattern. Uh, and, um, you know, this is sort of layered and curated in, you know, kind of in the way that it, what you would expect, I guess, from from a true artist. And I also think a true artist who really appreciates the uh, the romance that an interior can have that the objects and the colors and in this instance you know as as if the room is suffused in sunlight and here you know at least at this moment most of the sunlight is through the color of the paint yeah. oh sorry yeah, go ahead. Um, I was going to say also, uh, you know, sort of commonly we see throughout the house the, this sort of amber light, you know, <clears> she's <throat> done, of course, at that that window there as you uh, go up uh, the, the the main staircase uh, with the with the cutouts uh, sort of in between the glass. And, right. You know, again, trying to capture that 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 sort of uh, light that I guess he was so taken by I think in the in the Middle East right. um, which is sort of ironic to me because you know he's so representative of course of the Hudson River School of Painting which when I think about uh, about that and and the Hudson River in particular um, you know so much of that is about light it is about this this sort of unique um, ethereal light, which, um, you know, which we, we, we are all fortunate enough to sort of have in the Hudson Valley and particularly, you know, sort of in this area. So I guess like many artists, um, you know, we are very sensitive to and, and focused uh, on light and how to sort of capture it and, and how to reflect it um, in ways that, you um, you know, accentuate uh, also the the architecture and, as well as the decoration. Right, I'm always um, uh, taken with how the light reflects on that uh, carving detail underneath the staircase, um, and and how it changes during the day. Um, you know, creating a different experience throughout the day, but also how that that layering you had mentioned earlier underneath the staircase it's it's almost a virtual stenciling. Yeah, that's um, that's really true. I I love what you said earlier um, about the romantic um, and romanticism. I I feel like this um, composition really uh, embraces that. The you know um, you have this sense of so many worlds, so many romantic places. Um, you know, I think in the 19th century, traveling to the Far East um, and uh, and um, to Persia would have been, um, to Damascus, that would have been so romantic. And to bring these elements back here and, um, and play with the sense of light, um, a lot of uh, those buildings um, played with light. There's a kind of darkness and brightness that, um, um, you know, Islamic spaces, mm -hmm. Islamic art really um, enjoys playing with, with 
the windows and the covering of the windows. Um, so yeah, I find this to be a very romantic composition. And I think, um, Sean, if we could see the next slide, this is what you see if you're standing on the staircase is looking out into the into the court hall, which uh, from a uh, both an architectural and a decorative standpoint is is a virtual courtyard. Um, and this wonderfully luminous blue-ish ceiling, like the sky you would see in, in a house in Damascus, where the rooms are all built around the courtyard. But again, you know, you had mentioned Young earlier about the relevance of this interior. I think very much about um, interior design today, um, how these, you know, bright colors and layering of textures and introductions of different cultures and echoes of, of different um, periods and different re religious beliefs all in one space that's not necessarily a recreated space. It's, it's a, it's an invented space that, that, that makes you think of other places, but that is not any of those other places. Yeah, I mean, that's what I just love about this um, room is, first of all, instead of following sort of what everyone else was doing at the time, building your classic Beaux-Arts mansion, he decides to follow this, um, you know, uh, Persian layout with the um, cross and um, creating the center court. Mm -hmm. And uh, it created this beautiful open space that I think, you know, all of us love to see. And the glossy ceiling. I mean, Sheila and I were saying how this color story, how could it, it, it couldn't be more perfect. It's such a sophisticated, interesting color story with the ochre and the sky blue and um, the plums. Yeah, it's, it's um, so the beautiful. Color, the color, first of all, it's so, you know, it's so relevant still, uh, these colors. Um, you know, his sort of love of pigmentation, uh, which, are, you know, you see in so many different rooms. You know, the fact that... Um, you know, as we do as professional designers, you know, we we always look at ceilings as sort of the fifth wall. And the fact that he is also, you know, done that, you know, rather than just having sort of a typical, uh, you know, ceiling without color, you know, kind of in all of these spaces, you really mm -hmm. are enveloped uh, in, in the color and it sort of continues. Um, again, so much layering with all of the stencils, his attention, uh, you know, to detail um, in all of these stencils. And uh, I know apparently, uh, you know, he tried um, many stencils, um, you know, kind of over and over again till till they were sort of perfect, uh, which is which is also something that um, I think that, you know, we try to do um, as designers. Um, so I think it it wasn't, um, you know, he, he let that space sort of dictate and continue to create in the process. You know, it wasn't sort of like, okay, this is what I want and I'm going to do this stencil here, but it was more kind of fluid in the way that, mm -hmm. would, um, like most art, it, there was a certain element of discovery uh, I think, you know, kind of in his creative process, just in the same way, um, you know, he approached his his paintings. Yeah, I think one of my favorite um, objects in the collection of Olana is a wonderful sort of color board where he has, uh, where a church has placed various and sundry colors and tones onto one sort of semi-large sheet to, um, begin developing the color relationships within rooms, but also within the rooms that adjoin those rooms. Yeah, I think that being um, a painter, he was, he must have been incredibly sensitive and then also bold. I mean, it's not until you sort of paint a landscape that you realize, oh, these strange colors actually go together and highlight each other. Um, so I think this is a really unique color story and I think it reflects his um, his abilities and talents as a painter 
Um, I also just love that he, um, instead of having, you know, very European molding, he painted, he painted molding um, around the door. Mm -hmm. I love how he just um, painted the doors um, with these really imaginative patterns. Um, and, um, you know, he obviously loved Persian culture and, and embraced that, but not in like a weird way <laughs> where he was, right. you know, completely copying. It was just like he wanted to show his love and enthusiasm for this new way of thinking, for um, a, a new way of experiencing buildings and doorways and art. Um, and I think it's it's very um, uh, passionate and, and romantic. I just uh, chime in. I, we have a question about the authenticity of the colors, and I just wanted to quickly interject to say they, they have been restored based on paint analysis. So these are the original, the original palette. The one exception, uh, the stencils have only been cleaned. And um, for instance, on the doors, there was a lot of use of uh, pigments that had uh, metal alloy bases. So they would have, they've oxidized with exposure to oxygen over time to lose that glimmer and shine they would have had. Um, so, but otherwise uh, addressing that issue of the authenticity of the colors. One of the things, Sheila, that impresses me so much about this particular space, which I I, I know is, 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 is a hall, an entrance hall, a multi-purpose space. It could serve any number of functions is from a decorative standpoint, you really get the how to understand church and his understanding of um, flat finishes, glossy finishes, metal finishes. Um, Sean, you had just mentioned the metallic um, uh, ingredients within the paint and on the doors. This 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 idea of that it isn't about just decorating a room. It's about the relationships between the colors and the finishes and that you need luminosity, but you also need flatness. Yeah, I am. Um, one of the things, and again, you know, you can't really see this he here, but, um, you know, he did use uh, uh, sort of, I think, um, silver and gold paints, metallics, uh, things that were, were, were very reflective. Um, there were also, you know, a number of, of mirrors within the space. So again, I feel like he was quite skilled in um, and purposeful in in using um, you know metallics and as you said things that uh, kind of created this sort of luminosity um, and and understood you know the, like you said the contrast with having the glossy paint on the ceiling uh, versus things that are very matte and pigmented. Uh, on the walls, and mm -hmm. then again, um, this this layering of of different patterns uh, and different scales, and I think again, you know, because he's an artist, um, you know, he understands, you know, how better than anybody how sort of composition works and, right. and how to create uh, this sort of um, you know this, this sort of fine balance. Um, which which a lot of people probably would have had a very difficult time <laughs> achieving even you know even now so right well i mean that's why i was saying this this particular space there are so many ideas to take away um as someone who's interested in decoration and design um i mean you you, you don't necessarily think of frederick church as as a design columnist offering advice but but this this room you you can keep coming back to and keep taking away um concepts and ideas and and i think that you know the basic one always for me is that is there are the relationships between the finishes um and how they they activate a space yeah absolutely and um we were saying how um frederick church was probably the original Oat bohemian he was just so um, open to the mix, to celebrating all the different things that he collected along the way, the Chinese stands with the spooled, you know, chair. And um, he was really fearless in his mix of um, 
you know, of furnishings and styles and periods. And um, it's, it's such a global outlook, um, right. which is so exciting, you know, um, that he had that vision. Um, back and we then. want to make sure that we give um, credit to his wife, Isabel, um, because I, one of my favorite things about, about um, the documentation of, of Olana is uh, a letter that she has written about their trip to Damascus. I mean, they spent all these months abroad um, and her writing about the very things we're talking about, um, the, the geometric patterns, uh, stenciling, uh, marble inlays. Um, she's just as, as um, detailed with her eye um, as her husband is, maybe not in terms of the execution, um, but in terms of their having this partnership in, in appreciating what they're going to be living in. And Mitch, that's such a wonderful thing. I'll just add another quick historical footnote there about the evidence. There is a letter that Church writes to his good friend, uh, Rastus Del Palmer up in Albany, saying that he'd been up all night with Isabel sorting through patterns when they were doing the interior decoration. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's lovely to have that, that um, to have in, inspiration and information like that. So you, so you see that although Church is the starring role, um, that is Isabel gets her her play. Now the next room has always been so curious to me because it, it, it's at this moment you, for, for me at least visiting Olana um, the first time was not only the arrangement of the paintings on the walls creating sort of a, 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 a wainscot on top of a wainscot, um, but it's not really a salon hang because it doesn't go quite to the ceiling, so you're, it, it, it's almost like he's pulling the ceiling down a bit, but also the Thone chairs, so that you you realize that the dining chairs are are at that moment, 1870 to 1872, when Olana's being put together, it's a modern moment. Um, the, the, the Thone chairs are, are coming in, and, and you're seeing that he's appreciating um, not only um, the, the painting of his time, his own paintings, um, using paintings to create virtual windows um, on a wall that doesn't have a window, but also he's aware of of what's happening in terms of in terms of contemporary design. Uh, I um this room is is sort of fascinating to me uh, as well, uh, particularly I think you know as designers we we focus a lot uh, certainly for clients and probably for ourselves on art and also the the installation of art and and this is. Um, uh, you know, I, I would probably, Mitch, call it a salon wall, even, you know, maybe, I don't know, I guess that's, um, uh, we, we don't know uh, technically, but but what is interesting is that this is one of the, the rooms of the house that doesn't really have um, kind of this incredible, almost panoramic view or view of the Hudson River and that the windows are higher up, you mm -hmm. know, than most of the windows in the rest of the rooms, certainly on this floor. Um, and so, and that's even uh, a consideration uh, when it comes to art. We don't know that he was thinking about the conservancy of that art, but in a way he, he sort of um, it did that. So to me, you know, he really planned that this room was going to showcase these kind of European artists, uh, you know, probably art that he loved and collected, masters, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and I think, you know, people forget that artists, yes, in addition to the, the house being full of his own works of art, um, he also collected other artists who he admired as well, uh, which are which of course um, you know is in this dining room space. Um, I'm too am fascinated by those um, sort of bent wood uh, you know Thone chairs from Germany. He's got the Chickering um, piano uh, mm -hmm. as well, which was you know the during that time was I think the largest piano company in the United States. 
uh, before I think Steinway became bigger eventually. Um, and and also for me, it's it's the mix of furniture. Uh, you know, you, you see a table off to the side that looks like it could have been, it's sort of Moorish, uh, you know, for lack of better description, mm -hmm. with inlay you know, a chair that could be, I don't know, it looks almost like William and Mary, uh, right. things with turn legs, bent wood, caning, um, and then also just the color choice. So, you know, to me, he really was an artist designer um, in terms of, of his, his approach to uh, this dining space and the flexibility that it offers, you know, to have a table that can accommodate, uh, you know, a small number of, t of people for sort of an intimate dinner, but also, um, you know, that it expands and, and accommodates uh, a lot of uh, a bigger party, you know, as well. So to me, you know, that's him thinking uh, as a designer, in addition to being an artist. And I think also what's lovely is he's this room for a lot of reasons, um, says to me what he is not only thinking about as an artist and a designer, but also a homeowner somebody who's living in the space so that you have a seating area off into one corner, you have the piano, which I not many people have in their dining rooms. So there's this sense that it's, it's not just a space for dining, it's a space for multiple purposes. And it's also an art gallery. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's his own yeah. private museum. So people sitting around the table can you know look on what he's thinking about and what he and his wife are interested in. The other thing, just quickly, is um, I think about the the scale and also the fact that the the paintings look like they're hanging lower than what you might right. ordinarily see, and and that automatically creates a type of intimacy uh, with the art, um, and and it really begs people to you know to really see uh, what it is that's important to him um, because he's not hanging it up on the, you know, sort of picture molding, you know, or somewhere high. Uh, so there there becomes this relationship, both when you're dining or when you're just, you know, using the, the space with mm -hmm. everything from, you know, you, you see religious sort of uh, paintings to landscape, uh, portraiture. It's, it's, you know, a mix of things and, of course, all framed uh, very differently. Um, so I, I love, I guess, this sense of, of intimacy that I, I feel like this unique kind of salon wall, if, you know, I use that term loosely, mm -hmm. uh, kind of creates. Young, yeah. what do you, I wanted to ask you about, you know, so many times today, um, there's, there's such a great concern over the hanging of art, the positioning of a particular piece to ensure that it gets the most you know, it gets the maximum attention in a room, um, having a, you know a lot of space around it. Here, you always you you get the feeling that Frederick and Isabel are looking at each other, and she says, "Why don't we just look? There's a blank spot. Why don't we just hang that there?" I mean, it's it's not like a scientific hang, and I I find that really charming. I I agree. I think when I see this, I I imagine them saying, "I just want to please myself." This room is to please me, my artistic sense. I want to be able to see my paintings. If they're hung really high, like in a grand English house, I'm not going, you know, they're trophies. They're not, I can't, I imagine him saying, I want to see how they painted um, these different scenes and people. And clearly the Madonna in the center was a very important painting to him. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, of course, as Sheila says, I didn't know Frederick Church, but <laughs> I imagine this must be the story just from what I see is that this painting was very important to him. And then everything else came low and he wanted to collect all of these um, and have this intimate experience with the paintings. Um, as you had said, you, you can imagine sitting on those chairs and just being able to study the paintings. And, you know, this is sort of a room where, you know, he must have thought the Thane chairs were comfortable and he added this Biedermeier bench. And, um, you know, he, this was 
all about his collection versus um, a lot of decoration. Although you can see, like, I, I just love how he has to paint in lieu of molding, having the painted mm. stencils. So I, I just want to interject that I, I wonder if it changes your thoughts at all to know that we do have evidence that when he was shipping a lot of these paintings back from that 1868, uh, 67, 68, 69 trip, um, one of the big trunks had a note on top to his friends who picked it up at the uh, at the dock in New York City saying in the you will find here enclosed my old masters with his own quotes around it he said fear not i paid a grand total of 31 dollars for the lot although there may be one or two good ones in it <laughs> so, so I just think it's it's moving it more for I always interpret it as moving it more towards design and decoration and pattern and con you know, conjunction of things. For instance, we're not seeing in this photo, but there's a wonderful Italian cassone with the same sort of rinso as the border of the fake Murillo painting there right. underneath it. You know, and I love that he he put old masters in quotation marks so that. <laughs> Even though he's an artist and he's a collector, an acquirer, um, it didn't seem to matter whether they were real or not. I mean, it's that Elsie DeWolf comment uh, when someone posed to her the question of how did she feel about reproductions, furniture, and she said she didn't really care because it's the effect you're after, isn't it? Yes. And, and I think this is a room that really lets you know that. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that story. Now, our next room is the um, dressing room. And I I, I, I love, I love this space because so it's for both of them. Yeah. And it's for Frederick and Isabel, their dressing room. I don't think today's clients want to share a dressing room. <laughs> That's I love this space and I love the little sink tucked into the corner like that because it's, it's, it's beautifully... Um, articulated it is beautifully articulated uh this is one of my favorite uh spaces in this house and i every time i'm there i try to figure out why that is um i think it is you know again this meticulous attention to detail in the staircase in the design uh in the um, drawers that, you know, the storage that is, you know, under the stair, the, the mm -hmm. moldings, um, this wallpaper and trim and the, the curvature of the, you know, the sink, um, just, you know, these very um, specific, meticulous details, um, which, uh, you know, that seems to be, you know, kind of who he, who he was. Um, so it's not not surprising, but um, this just remains one of my um, my favorite spaces. I mean, this could be in the world of interiors today. <laughs> it's so beautiful, the sort of the roundness of that sink, the curve of the staircase, the pattern mix again, and the colors are just so today um it's it's so lovely and i love the texture of the wallpaper which um, was reproduced by adelphi yep. wallpapers right and it's yes. kind of japanese paper originally um but and can we just sorry sorry young go ahead yeah can we just talk about wallpaper for a second um just again you know that wallpaper is so popular again, you know, in contemporary interiors. Um, this idea of, of layering and depth and, um, you know, luminosity, you know, uh, there's so many, um, you know, kind of layers, uh, which is probably why wallpaper is so, you know, popular again, you know. Um, so it's, it's refreshing to see this um, because as you said, um, you know, this could be in world of interiors, you know, today and, and you would know that it was, you know, created, uh, you know, in the 1870s or 1860s. So. Well, that's what's- so I also like how that painting is just hung 
yes. in a way that <laughs> nobody would hang it today. I mean, it's it's it 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 actually draws your eye much more strongly than it would if it were sort of hung more conventionally within the center of that space that it's occupying. Yeah, I love that quirky moment. And and those are the things that actually create um, personality and interest and intimacy. You feel like, oh, you know, someone just thought that that would be a really cool touch. Um, and uh, it's, it's perfectly imperfect that um, art placement. Perfectly imperfect, I think is the should be the watch word for this house. <laughs> um, and this wallpaper, I mean, I would love to copy that. It's almost like domino papers, but so exact. And then the Japanese, you know, sort of um, irregular irregularity and the luminosity of it is so, so beautiful. And that tape trim um, going along the, the chair rail is just so pretty. I remember talking with um, Steve Larson over at Adelphi Paper Hangings about the recreation of, of, of one of the Japanese papers at, at Olana. Um, and it's a paper that isn't made anymore. Um, I mean, in any shape or form. And he had to go to Japan and had to study it. And it's sort of a like a gold leaf on, like you said, dominoes that then is painted over, which is then crumpled by hand and wow. then pressed out flat again and then applied onto the wall. It's amazing. So amazing. Uh, there's so much beautiful craft. And that's the other part of the interior design story you can see is there's there's so many hands touched this home to make the woodwork, to to paint the stencils, to make the papers, to create the floors. Um, I just, you know, the more you see that the, the craftsmanship and the hand of the maker, the more beautiful and soulful I think an interior is. And also we're looking at a room that it like, we know it's the dressing room. It's it's for both Isabel and Frederick. The staircase goes up to the children's quarters, and and you realize this is a very luxurious paper um, in this room that that gets a lot of use several times a day. So I'm always thinking kids running up and down the stairs, visiting their parents, their parents going up the stairs, and yet with this this elaborate um, handmade Japanese paper. That that adds a, a, a note of glitter um, within you know the the wood features of this space. Yeah, I mean, so I'll just interject that we have about five minutes before we'd like to transition oh. To questions. Oh, all right. So can we go to the quickly to the next slide? Um, another thing I know, Sheila, that you mentioned earlier um, about the views um, in this house and his. For me, the idea of, of, of him creating windows that are virtual paintings so that they're actually framed within purposeful frames uh, so that you're not only looking at paintings on the wall, you turn around and you're looking at a painting outside that could be a painting, but it's a picture window. Yeah, he's done such an incredible job of, uh, you know, we haven't really talked about the, the views, but... Uh, he has captured, you know, these incredible views, uh, which were carefully thought out, and he's created these, you know, paintings, uh, almost um, these framed views, uh, you know, throughout um, the house, and, and this certainly is one of them. Um, one of the things that is, that is obvious um, when you come to Alana, and if you're at the house is this the importance of this dialogue between the landscape and the interior and and you you get that sense in in pretty much every room in the house um you know his reverence for for nature for the landscape for the mountains the hudson river um and and again bringing that you know sort of also inside and framing everything 
you know, taking the same amount of time and care that you would if you were, you know, if this was actually one of his paintings and, and actually constructed a frame. And, and we think so often of that, you know, that, that sense of porousness, that indoor outdoor feeling as being a very 20th century concept. And, and here you see, you know, um, you know, in the 1870s, he's, he's presenting this as, as a sort of, a, I guess, an astonishing new idea to many people. And this, when I first saw this image, I thought it actually was a painting with a decorative frame around it. Um, it's just so beautiful, so romantic. And, um, you know, I just, he has this natural view, but he had to add a little decoration to it. Um, and that's what I love about this window. And then the next slide is of the studio, which has a similar window. Um, in the sense of framing a view here framed in sort of an ingle nook idea with, within the arch. So it's, it's, you're looking into a space and then looking into another picture. Yeah. This is his um, studio. I love the Mexican tile that he mm -hmm. collected from his travels and then looking out into the view. Um, apparently this has the most uh, regular light. So he painted here, um, but, um, you know, instead of having just the open artist studio, he still has the framed doorway, the sort of Indian jealousy window concept. Um, but I love that, you know, he decided it's my studio, but it's gonna be beautifully decorated with flesh um, chairs uh, with rope trim, and uh, it's just a very warm and inviting room. And um, also, I also think it's really bold to have such deeply pigmented walls yes. while you're painting. Most people want very white walls to see color well, but he was clearly such a master of color. He was not afraid of that. And I love the sort of the explosive charge of the yellow and blue upholstery against these sort of terracotta, this very matte sort of flower pot colored walls. Yeah, he seems to be pretty fearless, uh, you know, in his um, approach to color. Uh, I love these deeply tufted, buttoned, um, they almost look like French, you know, sort of chairs with a bouillon mm. fringe. Um, you know, again, just, um, quite a mix of, of different uh, furniture styles. Um, I love kind of the sparseness of the, you know, the amount of artwork that's in his studio space versus, you know, like the dining room, for instance, um, you know, that this is a real uh, working, working studio, but, um, you know, even in a working studio, it's important to, to be inspired and, and there's, um, you know, plenty of inspiration hear from him uh, both you know outside of the the window but but also you know inside as well right and like as as young was saying about you know the sort of it, it's it's as much a furnished inviting room as any other in the house although it's his studio with the mexican tiles but you also have the beautifully painted doors again a picture hung in a very funny way up rather high yeah. um it, it it's just it 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 just shows you how um, memorable idiosyncratic decoration can be. Um, and Sean put in the next um, uh, slide, which is, is wonderful, showing the working and the reworking and the uh, overworking of, of <laughs> staircase details, um, the thought that went into this house. Yes, and, and maybe this is a good segue. We're now at just 10 minutes before the hour. And, you know, this is uh, a slide that I used in a talk I did on the, uh, and this is a, one of the first questions we got was sort of what is there evidence that church actually did all this? And and my talk uh, really shows that we have, you know, almost, I think, 500 or more uh, uh, drawings in church's hand for the house, its architecture, its decorative detailing, the architectural fittings in particular, like the stair rails and the arcades and, and every window has intense studies for it. Um, we, we have the pallet board that you mentioned, a couple of them actually, Mitch, mm -hmm. you 
that. Uh, people have been wanting to know about that. And that would be something we could send an image of in a follow-up email to people if they'd like. Uh, we will. Um, and then um, we ha also have a, the original stencils, or at least most of them, for, and they have the paint still you know, smeared on them. Uh, so uh, it's really, there is a lot of evidence for how hands-on church was in all aspects of the design. So I just answered the first question. Sorry. I'm going to, that one was more historical. I'll turn um, some of the other questions. One is about the sort of labeling of style of the place. And this is something we get all the time. If you had, you know, this is a historic design question, I suppose. And the question is, why do you not see this as a prime example of American aestheticism? Oh, I think it absolutely does. It, 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 but I mean, American aestheticism is this sort of mix master um, uh, creation recipe. Yes, it's absolutely American aestheticism. Um, but, you know, you can also call it bohemianism. You can also call it, you know, um, Persian refracted through, a, 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 you know, a, 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 an artistic lens. I mean, there's a lot going on in that house. And I think I would say that, yes, you know, big umbrella American aestheticism. But I think within that, you can just keep breaking it down and breaking it down and breaking it down. Great. And um, let's see. Uh... See if there uh there was a question there are questions about how the objects did they were they fixed in place or did they change and evolve? That's another historical question. They did evolve like any home. This I think, you know, if if Church had lived in the, he died at 70, uh, uh, 74 years of age, not, you know, in our time, a very uh, old age. I'm sure he would have gone on to other layers and other renovations. The studio space is one of the last ones. I mean, maybe there's a question. I don't know if you see any sort of shift in his approach there or not from the other interiors. I mean, again, he was changing those as well, though. So a lot of the chimney pieces, the surrounds, for instance, are uh, 18, late 1880s, 1890. So uh, let's see. Uh, the questions came in several different places. So I'm just trying to. Uh, um... Just going back to labeling the style of um, the house, mm. um, I think that um, you know what I love about this home is that it it's it's so um, is saying I don't want to follow these trends and patterns. I I'm my own person, at least the way I see it. It's it has so much freedom and expression. Um, and, uh, you know, I think Americans, we love um, putting labels on things like what's proper molding, mm. what's proper detailing for this time and et cetera. And this defies all of those rules. And I just think that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I, I, to go back to the, the comment about American aestheticism, yes, but this is one done by a chef who's throwing in whatever ingredient pleases him at that moment. It's not necessarily a formulaic um, approach to American aestheticism as say you could see in a Herder Brothers interior. Um, th this is this is very much an independent aestheticism. And if we had all the money in the world to do restoration and conservation on the pieces that aren't here, you would see even more <laughs> influences, particularly East Asian. Very interesting. A lot mm -hmm. of the textiles. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how common it was at the time for people to sort of um, have the type of sort of expedition or travel that he did. I mean, he was everywhere from... Uh, South America to Egypt to Beirut to, to Rome, Jamaica, Palestine, you know, and then brought either physically brought or then, you know, was inspired enough by these places that he figured out a way to to incorporate them, you know, kind of into his own uh, you know, vernacular or his own aesthetic. Um, so um I, I think it's um hard to 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 label it um because the the influences are so varied uh and i don't think that that and was typical uh of of most people um you know at that at that time 
I have a couple questions design related, one going back to the court hall slide showing the wall to wall carpet, which is a reproduction of the original. Um, the questions are, can you comment on the style of carpet, you know, and sort of the 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 its qualities and how it works with the room you know uh one thing that is missing are all the area rugs that were over the top of this so this was a background piece but that's a question well this is a really lovely overall print and it's a very um it's a two color rug so um i see that as a neutral <laughs> what do you think sheila yeah i agree agree i think that not only the scale but also the color it, it reads as backdrop it reads as neutral and again you know there would have been many rugs layered on top of this carpet um so but um to me that you know what we still do when we are asked to have kind of a base layer of of carpet, um, uh, you know, and then again layer on all these other these other small carpets on top. Yes, one of the unfortunate accommodations for public access and tripping tripping hazards and thing are area rugs. <laughs> uh, these days, there are some new techniques for reproduction that we might be exploring. You know, where you can almost do digital photographs. We have done those for the stair hall uh, stair carpets. Um, other, there is another stream of questioning, which again is historical, but there's three or four questions on it, uh, uh, which is what are his influences? Where did he travel to? Did he see specific interiors that might've inspired him? And people are mentioning the Sone Museum, uh, a lot of English places, the Peacock Room, uh, uh, and, um, I think of Leighton House, of course, that's something that comes up all the right. time. Um, and the answer is probably not. Um, we don't, he he didn't stay too long in England. He had no taste for the usual grand tour destinations. Um, and he did sell paintings in England. Um, he might have gotten to the zone. Wouldn't that be fascinating? Um, the yellow light and everything there. Um, but um, uh, we uh, definitely Leighton House, the Arab Hall was later than his, he, he, the last time he was in Europe was 1869. That's 1875, uh, uh, 77. Uh, and also the Peacock Room, same time later. So, you know, this is, uh, it's an early, early interior that way. And the other thing I think would be interesting is that when he was traveling abroad in the, in the near, and in the Near East and Middle East, um, stained glass was already a big part of the uh, the uh, architecture and interior design vernacular. So he would have stumbled across um, rooms in Damascus or or Beirut, where th there was already yellow glass being used and pink glass and um, just in in different ways than he would have seen it in say Western Europe. Absolutely. He also used books like we all do. Uh, publications were extremely important to him. Didn't have websites to go to, but the library is full of of design reference books. So. Um, which is important. Uh, another question for you design wise, and we're really pretty much probably will be the last question. I'm sorry for those people we didn't get to, but how much of the interior design is reflected from the exterior design, specifically the main entrance around that space? And, you know, do you see like, what is your view of the way in which the patterns maybe relate to each other is perhaps part of the question. How do the patterns relate to the exterior? Yeah, you know, is there a, is it a, a mirror of, you know, is it a continuum or is the interior very distinct from what you feel the exterior? I think the interior is very distinct. Um, I think it's, it's about the human experience, about the interior experience, how we experience rooms and space and color and texture and comfort. So I think it's a very different, differently curated artwork and the interiors than the exterior. I mean, there is, uh, you know, decoration, if you will, on the exterior as well. Um, there's, you know, colors and uh, a lot of detailing, but but I but I feel like the two are very distinctive. Um, he thought so much about about the landscape and creating, you know, the views. Um, he really, you know, the trees that he planted, uh, how many trees, Sean, did he? Tens of thousands of them. The last delivery, uh, one of the last deliveries was, you know, uh, uh, 3,000 hemlock seedlings at one time, you know. 
Yeah. So he was, he was, oh, I, to me, he was always, um, you know, he was a conservationist. I mean, he really cared about nature and was always um, thinking about framing, uh, you know, these different views, creating these interesting um, kind of view sheds uh, specifically from, from each space. So I feel like, um, you know, the two, while, while there's a relationship, I, I think the, the interior is, is kind of, its own its own art and that's a great end if you don't mind we are at time i can't thank the three of you enough i mean i this just inspires me i want to do another chapter two you know i mean get in more depth in some of the spaces with you uh just the insights you had about color in particular really um helped me understand a little bit better um what i'm experiencing thank you thank you for having us thanks everybody thank you very much for attending Yes, thank you all for coming. Uh, and uh, thank you for all your questions. Come on a tour uh, soon, and you'll get a lot of those historical questions addressed. <laughs> <laughs>